What I want to talk about this evening is life. Life. Just that one single word. Um, and why is this important? Well, you know, it's interesting that the Bible speaks about life and, and emphasizes life. For example, the word life is used in the book of Revelation in several places. God says that those who overcome will be privileged to eat from what? The tree of life. And it says from the throne of God there flows a river of what? A river, the river of the water of life. And God says again, those who overcome, I will give him what? Eternal life and also a crown of life. So life is emphasized in the word of God as being something important. You have a crown of life, a tree of life, you have everlasting life, you have a river of life. God associates some of the most precious things that we cherish and look forward to with this word life. So I want us to consider this question. What really is life? Now, you know, what really led me off into thinking along this way is some discussions that I've been having with people from time to time. One of the, one of the ideas that some of my friends have, and I don't know that anybody here has that idea, but I'm going to put... I'm going to put the issue before you so you can think about it. I wanted to think about it because it has made me think. Some people have been discussing this with me on the internet, and I have a friend in America, more than one, who believes that what we actually receive from God is not Christ's own personal existence. Before we can even come to grips with what I'm saying, we need to define life, which I will do in a moment. But many people believe and they argue very strongly about this. And they use Bible verses. And they use quotations from Ellen White to try to say, God is in heaven. You are not a part of God. Now, you know, when you talk about receiving the life of God, it can sound bad. It can sound wrong. Because pagans believe that man and God are, are actually on the same level. It's just that man needs to develop his, his godhood. The Mormons believe that as we are today, God once was. And they believe that we are gods. But we just need to develop until one day we become like the supreme God. He once was like us. And even today in heaven, God has several wives. He's married and he's producing spirit children. And we will have the privilege of also becoming God and producing our own spirit children. The Mormons believe this. Pagans believe that we have divinity in ourselves. We only need to develop this divinity. So when you start saying... We partake of the actual life, the actual existence of God. Some people get very scared, and they say, be careful. They use a word, pantheism. And pantheism is, is a pagan idea which says that everything is God. And if we are a part of God, then are we not promoting, if we are saying this, are we not promoting pantheism? And so these friends of mine, they are very careful to say, what happens to us is that as we read the word of God, our minds begin to change. And as our minds change, and as our attitude changes, and as our characters change, we actually become like Christ. And so in this sense, we partake of the life of Christ. But it is not that Christ himself actually comes to live inside of us. Now, I don't know how you would deal with an idea like this, but the more I think about it and I study the Bible, you know, it makes me a little bit afraid when I think of that idea. It makes me scared because I see implications behind it that I don't like. You know what I've done? And I think what all of us should do. Each time somebody comes to me this kind of way, questions come into my mind. And I go back and I take the Bible and I start reading and I start looking at verses. And each time I come, I cannot escape the conclusion, God really has given us his own life. And I want us to look at some of the evidences this evening and to see why I say this. But first of all, let me tell you why, what kind of arguments those people will use. For example, in John chapter 6, and I believe it is verse 63, Jesus says, The words that I speak unto you, it is what? They are spirit and they are life. They use words like this. They use verses like this. The verse says that Jesus says, Except you eat of my flesh, and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. 
And then he says, it is a spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. Then he goes on to say, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are alive. So those people are not just picking an idea out of the air. They believe they have some biblical backing for that idea. You know, Peter talks about the word of God, which is able to, we are born again from the, by the word of God. So the word, they believe, is what actually you interact with. And when you interact with the world, with the word, you actually become like Christ. And in this sense, you receive the life of Christ. Christ is the word. But then again, I don't know how they would answer that because, to be honest, I never got into that kind of discussion. But we know life is very important. And I want to ask this question now. What is life? And I, I, probably we can begin by saying what life is not. Life is everything that death is not. If you think about death and you think about life, you know that you begin to get some kind of idea of what life is. In the book of James, in James 4 and verse 14, James says that man's life, what is your life? Let me just read it quickly here then. James says, what is your life? Let me begin from the beginning. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That's kind of a very vague explanation of life. James says it is a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Now a vapor is, is what? Something like smoke, right? Something like steam. James says your life is no more than this. So you don't know what will be, happen on tomorrow. When I was a boy, I learned this song that goes something like this. Man's life's a vapor full of woes. So like a vapor down he goes. Down and down and down and down and down he goes. I learned that as a boy. But I didn't, know, I, didn't, I didn't even know what it meant. But here it's taken from the book of James. James says man's life is a vapor. But the question really is, here's a question, and it's a million dollar question, and if you can answer this question, people will flock to you from every part of the world. The question is simply, what is life? You can tell what happens when something is alive, can't you? Generally speaking, it is able to interact with its environment. You have different kinds of life, right? You have human life, you have the life of animals, you have the life of insects, you have the life of plants. But when you have life, you can grow, you can interact with your environment. There's some way that you, 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 you manifest life. You're able to develop. But exactly what is life? Is life a spark of electricity? Is life the breath that enters and leaves your lungs? Both of these questions, you know, are incorrect. Both of these solutions, those, those ideas. Because if you take a dead, piece, a, a dead man lying on the ground and you run a, as much electricity as you want through his body, he won't come to life. You might kill him more, as Ian is saying. And if you, if, you take, if you take this man who is lying on the ground and you pump air into his lungs, he still won't come alive. What is life? We don't know. That is actual fact. We don't know. But we know that it is some essential element that when you have it, you become conscious. As far as humans are concerned, you become conscious, alive. You can love. You can laugh. You can, you can develop character. You can think. You can reason. All of these things are there when life is there. And when life is gone, everything is still in place that you have ever seen in this person. The, if, you, if you cut him, you will see the brain, you'll see the blood, you'll see the marrow, you'll see the bones. Everything is still in place. But now nothing is alive. Something has left. And when it leaves, we say the person is dead. But we cannot tell what has left. And we cannot tell what it is that caused this person to be what we call alive. This is a very important question. Because what God says is that he gives us life. And if we cannot understand what life is, if we cannot at least have some kind of understanding of, of what life is, then we cannot understand what God has given us. Go right ahead.
Okay. All right. Tracy says life is essentially God. Um, I think ultimately we're going to come to that conclusion, although I might word it a little differently. It, because if you just leave it like that, you will say that a tree has life, therefore a tree has God. So it's just that the way it's worded, we need to be careful, right? All life, of course, comes from God. The Bible teaches this very clearly. God spoke and life sprang into existence. But I think we need to, how we word it, we need to be careful about it because we don't want to be misunderstood. Well, before we, 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 we look at the, this issue a little more closely, where does life come from? The same question that I just asked. According to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it says that God formed man from the dust of the earth, and then he did what? He breathed into his nostrils something that is called what? The breath of life, and man became a living soul. What was the difference between the form that was shaped from the clay and the living soul? What was the difference? One had the breath of life, and one did not. And if you are very, very simple, and very traditional, you'll say that all God did was start him breathing. And the breath of life becomes air, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and these things that go, are in the air. They entered his lungs, and he became alive, and that is life. If you are very simple, you might believe this. Well, that's what I was taught, and that's what many Adventists believe, that all that happens is that the process of breathing starts, and that is life. But this, life is more than this. Because when you stop breathing, no matter how somebody blows air into your lungs, you don't come back to life. Well, if, 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 you, if, you, if you have been drowning, for example, and you stop breathing, they might be able to start the process because life is still in you, although you have stopped breathing. It's not the breath that brings you back to life. It's the fact that life is not entirely gone. It can be revived. Of course, life cannot exist without breathing. Life cannot exist without your blood flowing. But your blood flowing is not life, and your breathing is not life. They are simply functions of a living person. But we know that God is the originator of life because the Bible says he breathed into man's nostrils. Not breath, not breath, but the breath of life. And in actual fact, the word that is translated breath is the Hebrew word ruach. And the word ruach, in Hebrew, it does not necessarily mean breath. It can also mean air, wind, or spirit. And I believe that the word should be properly translated. God breathed into man's nostrils the spirit of life. The spirit of life. Not air, not wind. God didn't just blow air on man and then suddenly sprang into life. He breathed into him. He put into him the spirit of life, that essential thing that makes a person alive. And that is what we call what? Life. Or the spirit. The spirit. Now, there are some... <coughs> That's right. It had to be breath because it's got, it says it breathed into his nostrils. But it's interesting when you look at what Jesus did in, I believe it's John chapter 20. When Jesus was about to go away, he came to his disciples and he did what? He breathed on them and said what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I think it's the same reason why God breathed on Adam in the beginning. Right? Why did God breathe on Adam when Adam received life? And why did Christ breathe on his disciples when he was giving them what? Life again. But what kind of life now? divine life, spiritual life, a different kind and quality of life. Because that's the other thing we want to look at. Is all life equal? Well, you know, it's hard to, to say. I don't know enough about life to tell you if all life is equal. I don't know. Because I don't know if a tree and an ant and a bird and a human being has the same life. What is life? Until I can answer that question, I cannot tell you. Uh, yes, Hope Time. That's what we're trying to answer. That's right. The life before evidently was not divine life. Man does not possess divine life of himself. As 
we are outside of Christ. We do not have divine life, but we have life. That's why I'm saying to you that... You mean it with Adam? I'm sure that Adam had divine life. Right, but I think we need to look at... I, I think we need to look at ourselves here, that we don't get too involved and complicated. We need to understand that there are two kinds of life. There's physical life, and there's, there's divine life, or what we call spiritual life, right? And for the purposes of this discussion, that's where we're going to kind of discuss and circle around, because it can get very involved and drag us off track. There's a point I want to make, and I don't want us to get taken off track. Now, so Adam... Jesus, there, there, there's divine life and there is physical life. Now, where physical life is concerned, I know that a tree's life reveals itself in a different way than a dog's life, reveals itself in a different way than a human's life. But all of them have a spark in them that makes them live. Is it the same spark in the tree that is in the dog that is in the human being? I don't know. But one thing we are sure of is that life manifests itself in different ways. And that's the point I want us to look at in just a moment. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> and now he's not talking about life, but you know, I want to just use this until it's something similar. He says in verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Well, he's really talking about the resurrection and the different kinds of bodies we have. But I want to apply the same principle in looking at the different kinds of life, because... The thing about life, the kind of life you have manifests itself. How? In where it is, anything else. In the way you live, in the way you behave. Some people might look very much like monkeys, right? But you know that they are different because of what? They behave differently, right? A dog and a wolf look very similar but their behavior is very different. I suppose that you could say they have the same kind of life. Maybe my illustration is not right. But the life that is in a, one of these bugs that we see here certainly manifests itself different from the life that is in a human being. The life in a human being manifests itself in intelligence, in, in hunger for spiritual things, in emotions, in feelings. Are these all functions of our brain or are they functions of something that is called Spirit. Now, can you give me a good reason why you would say that these things are functions of spirit rather than brain? Dogs have brain, cows have brain, animals have brain. That is one. They will say that their brains are not as developed as a human brain. What about a man who is outside of Christ? What is there that in a human that, that is different from, why is it that, where does our emotions, feelings, are these functions of the brain or of the spirit? Well, I'll tell you one, one I'll give you one reason why I say these are functions of the spirit. What happens to your brain when you die? It rots away, Right? In the resurrection, do you get back the same brain? Certainly not. Your brain is a physical thing. But when you come back in the resurrection, will you have feelings and emotions and love and all these qualities? Everything that exists in you today, apart from the sin, will be there in the resurrection if you come back in the resurrection. And yet you will have, it will not be the same brain. It will not be the same body. It will not be the same organs. Therefore, these qualities of life that make you more than an animal are not to do with your physical makeup. They are a part of the life that you have been given, which is human life. 
So I say human life is a different quality life from a dog's life. A dog's life will never manifest itself in the way that your human life manifests itself. There are different kinds. Life manifests itself in different ways depending on what kind of creature you are. Of course. That's right. Although the Bible says Balaam's donkey talk, you know it was an angel talking through that donkey. That donkey never talked, never did, never will. Same way Satan spoke through the serpent, of course. When? Angels have spoken through men. Angels have spoken through men. The Spirit of God has taken over people and spoken through them. But the point is, in our Christian life, does an angel speak through us, take us over and make us live like Christ? Or is this something that is our experience as Christians? Is this something that we participate in? Is this our experience or the experience of an angel when we are born again? If that's what you're talking about, Howard, then absolutely not. Okay, right. Yeah, let's stick to it. Now, is the spirit then the same as the life? Look at what it says in James chapter 2 and verse 26. And what I'm wanting to do, I want to stir up our thoughts as we, t we, we, we look at this. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, I believe something. But sometimes you say, I believe, and the implications of it don't really reach you. One time I was reading a book and it said that there was a boat. It was presenting some evidence to say that there's a boat on the side of a mountain, 4,000 feet, no, four miles up on a mountain. They have, they have seen evidence of a boat. A bo it, it, was, it was actually Noah's Ark, but this book was not a Christian book. It was like a, a secular book I was reading and it, it was giving you the evidence that they had found a boat four, hundred, four miles up on the side of a mountain. Now, I've always read about Noah's Ark in the Bible, right? But that day when I was reading that book, it suddenly hit me. Four miles up on the side of a mountain, there's a boat. How on this planet did a boat reach four miles up on the mountain? And when it, it reached me, everything I'd read in the Bible, I read and I knew from when I was a boy that no, there was a flood and there was Noah's Ark. But when I read that, something thrilled through me differently. And I felt almost like my head got bigger. Sometimes there's sometimes you see evidence and it makes you come to grips with what you're really saying. And it does something, it changes you. And that's where we talk about faith. That's what faith is. It's when the things that you say you believe and the things that you speak about suddenly reach you in a different way that it makes you want to do something about it. You cannot help doing something about it. Then you say that your belief is more than belief. It has, it has been transformed into faith. And what we are looking at this evening, I want you to understand what it is that God has given us. And that's why I'm looking at this question. That's why we are looking at this, dissecting it, analyzing it, breaking it down, thinking about it the best way that we can, and seeing if we really can come to the conclusion of what we have been saying all along. If it really is true. If logically, reasonably, scripturally, it is true. Because when we truly believe, it makes a great difference to our lives. So it says in James chapter 2 and verse 26, as the body without the spirit is what? dead. So faith without works is dead. So there James tells you clearly that when the spirit leaves the body, then the body is dead. So death is the departure of the spirit from the body. And yet everything in that body is exactly the same as it was before the spirit left it, except that the functions are no longer taking place. Some spark has left the body. The blood is there, the bones are there, the flesh is there, the brain is there, the nerves are there, but they are no longer interacting with each other. Something has left. And this thing is called life or it is called spirit. Now that's very important. Something we need to be certain about. In 1 John 5 and verse 11, it tells you that God has done something for man. In fact, hold that verse and go to Ephesians 2 before we go there. 
Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read verse 1. It says, and you hath he quickened. The word quickened means what? You has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 4 says the same. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Now one thing we see very clearly is that the Bible is telling us that there's a point in our experience when we are dead. Now dead means that you have no what? Life. Now, it cannot mean physical life because we just saw physical life means that you are breathing, you are eating, you are moving about, you are thinking. All of these functions are taking place. But if he says you were dead spiritually, what does it mean? You don't have the life of God. How does that manifest itself? How do you know that you are dead spiritually? Your works are dead. Compare it to physical death and give me in that setting. How do you know you are physically dead? You cannot function. You can do nothing pertaining to life. That's what happens when you are physically dead. You can do nothing that pertains to life. You cannot see, speak, eat, breathe, walk, move, respond. Nothing you can do when you're physically dead. So if you're spiritually dead, what does it mean? There's nothing that pertains to the spiritual life that you are capable of. You are dead. You have no life in you. Yes, Tracy. It is a lie. That's right. It's like you get a dead man and you tie some strings to his hand and you have him jumping about. And say, look, he's alive. That's right. That's what it's like when a person outside of Christ is trying to do the works of Christ. It's an impossibility because you have no life in you. Jesus says, without me, what, what can you do? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. So the Bible says when we were dead, 1 John 5 and verse 11 says... God has done something for us. It says, God has given to us, what? This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So the critical question that we're looking at and that we want to just reemphasize here is, what has God given us? God has given us life. Has God given us words? To follow. Has God given us an example that we are to emulate? Or has God really sent something now to make it to make it to make it understandable, to, to, to simplify it? God is in heaven and I'm on earth. How does God give me life? Spiritually. Is there something and what would it be? Electricity? Some kind of energy? None of us can tell what life is. But has God really sent this life across the, the expanse of space, these billions of miles, and has he implanted something into my brain, brain, heart, mind, whatever you want to call it, and your mind, has he put something inside of me? Like he did in Adam at the beginning, that when it arrives, it makes spiritual activity possible? Whereas before spiritual activity was impossible. The right, right. Well, well I, I put it that way so we could kind of see what I'm saying. But of course, even if God's spirit is here, it has to come across space because that's where God is, right? So, so, so his life is everywhere. All right, yes, probably that's a better way to put it. In answering the question, what is this life? Go to Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. I know I'm satisfied, so I must have got it. Yes, yes. And if we don't believe it, then how can we be saved? Because we cannot have this life unless we believe it. 
Romans 8, verses 10 and 11. In fact, we'll read verse 2 first. It says, For the law of the spirit of life. Where? Where? In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So what is this life? It is said to be the law of the spirit of life. It's the spirit that gives us this life, whatever it is. Verses 10 and 11 say, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, it uses the word because, but I, I, as I look at the verse, I can't really see how because fits in here. The body is dead because of sin. If Christ is in you, the body is dead. I think the word because here implies the body is dead unto sin. But the spirit is life unto righteousness. In other words, the spirit is alive unto righteousness. And the body is dead unto sin. What it means is that when Christ lives in you, your body, your spirit takes on different characteristics. And to, 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 to simplify what I'm saying, if a human being were to receive the life of a dog, how would you know if he still looks like a human being? His behavior changes. Life carries with it a certain kind of behavior. And what makes a person or an animal behave is not what you learn to do so much. What is it? It's the kind of life that you have. So if we have been given the life of Christ, our behavior changes not because we are trying to live like Christ, but because the life that we have manifests itself in a certain kind of behavior. And that is why Paul says, but if Christ is in you, the body is what? Dead unto sin, but the spirit is what? Alive unto righteousness. When you are alive, you have to behave. You have to manifest behavior. You're going to breathe. Do you try to breathe? In fact, you have to make an effort to stop breathing when you're alive. Do you, do, you, do you have to make an effort to think, to move? I mean, these are functions of life. And they are natural functions. In the same way, when you receive the life of Christ, naturally you function like who? Like Christ. You function like a spiritual being because what you have is spiritual life. This is the life that we receive from God. Verse 11 says, same Romans 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from, of Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal flesh, your mortal bodies, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What is it that quickens or makes your body alive? What is it that makes your, your body alive? It is a spirit. It is not anything to do with effort or any struggle or any attempt to copy or emulate somebody else. Yes. Yes, Peter. Right, it could not be the, the physical life that we're talking about, right. So the function of the spiritual man is not breathing. And the function of the spiritual man is not eating. And the function of the spiritual man is not walking as we understand these words. What are some of the functions of the righteous man? Of the righteous life? Loving! Anything else? Okay, those are, those are the qualities of nature you see in this life. But the functions of the spiritual life are to bless others. That is one, right? The function of the spiritual life is to testify of Christ. The function of the spiritual life is to love to communicate with God. These are natural functions of the spiritual life that you don't have to struggle and fight to do when that life is in you. Yes, Tracy. Yes. Yes. 
Remember what I said. The natural function of the spiritual life as opposed to the unnatural attempt to copy the spiritual life. Now, of course, as you say, many people appear to be doing the same thing as a spiritual person. That is why Jesus says to you, what is your function as far as judging others is concerned? Do not judge others. Because who are you to tell the person that he, he, he's not actually in Christ? But what you're talking about is our experience, right? When I have to struggle and fight, do I have the, natu- the spiritual life? If it's a struggle and a battle for me, how can I be struggling and, and, and battling to live if I have life? Yes. Right. So I'm seeing it as it's an experience if your existence That's right. Life. That's because right. Because when you go from this earth and you go to the new earth, you're not gonna have anybody to partake witness to. Right. You know, as we go down here right. or um, to be there for our journey journey. It's a different kind of ex- existence. Mm-hmm. Right, but remember what, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. You're quite right that when you have eternal life, as opposed to everlasting life, everlasting life is time, right? Eternal life, as, I, as, as I'm making a distinction here, eternal life is a quality of life. And of course, eternal life is the life of Christ. Christ has eternal life, and the only people who have it are those who are in Christ. So eternal life is an experience where you're passed from death to life. But I'm saying, when you have it, Does it manifest itself? And the manifestation of this life is in a behavior that is above the behavior of the flesh. So there are certain things you can look at flesh and know that this person is alive. You can also look at this person and know that this person is spiritually alive. That's why Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. It's true that some people can seem to copy this life for a time. But not all the time. And it's not natural as Ken is saying. It's an effort and a strain, and that is why it breaks after a while. The true colors are bound to show up because it's not natural. (laughs) All right. Now, can words give us this life? Let's look at a couple of verses that answer this question. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. This is in verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid! For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily or truly, righteousness should have been by the law. Now, is the law the word of God? It is the word of God. It is the written word of God. Can the written word of God give you life? Why don't we have a chorus of no's? Of course not. The written word cannot give you life. The Bible says here, if there had been a law which could have given life, then God would have made righteousness through the law or through the words. Words cannot give you life. Words can only describe life. But it says in verse 24, so what is the purpose of the law or the written word? Verse 24 says what? Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The purpose of the written word is to bring us where? To the living word. You know, let me use an illustration that I used a couple of times. I don't know if I use it with you, brethren, but I'm going to use it again because I want you to get this idea clear. Like I said yesterday, I think I, I used the illustration. But you know, I have a board here. I have a chalkboard. I have a whiteboard or whatever kind of board. And I write on this board, wearing a jacket and a blue shirt, sitting at the back, graying hair, about five foot, seven inches tall, 
sitting on the right hand side at the back when you're facing the front. I said, Peter, I wanted to give this person a message. Tell this person that I want to see him at 4 o'clock. Now I write this description on the board. And what does Peter do? Peter comes and he starts talking to the board. Because I, I, I put this, th these words on the board. And Peter comes and he says, listen, David has a message to give you. Or David says that you are to give me such and such a thing. And he's talking to the board. What would you think about Peter? Yeah, he's crazy. Of course he's crazy. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to look for the person that is being described here. And if he looks for the person, he would go to the back and he would go to daddy. And then he would interact with a living person, right? Because this description is a description of daddy. Now most people read the description in the Bible. And what does that description describe? The character of Christ. And what are they looking for? Righteousness. Can you find that righteousness in the description? So when you start relating to the description, what are you? You're a poor, deluded, foolish person. To find life, you've got to go to the thing that is being described. So the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ where we can find true righteousness that the law could only describe. But many of us sit down with the law. And we don't find the living word. And that is what's happening to my friends. They are saying, look here, it's the words that change you. Can words give you life? Can words change your heart? Can words make you into a new creation? Impossible. But you know what is the problem? If you say it is words, you know what it means? It means that you, the human being, can do something about your condition. You can read the words and try to obey them, right? But if I say it is not the words, it is Christ, what are you left to do? You had better find Christ. Humanity has no help in it. There's no help in your muscles or your strength because if I say it is a life that human beings do not have and cannot have anywhere on this planet, your hope is gone if it does not exist in Christ alone. What I'm sending you to do is go find Christ because he alone has this life. You can't get it any other way and no matter how you try, you're only a dead person trying to walk. Only when Christ gives us this life can we begin to see any change. If you're not born again into this life, you're wasting your time trying to be a Christian. That's what I'm saying. Christianity is a supernatural experience. And when I say supernatural, I mean God is the root of it. It is not human. And that's the biggest lesson that we need to learn. That's a problem that all these legalists have. They are trying to produce something out of humanity that does not exist there. What God gives us is life. And life is an element that is real. You might not be able to describe it, find it in a test tube, describe it in a biology class, but it is real. It exists. The physical teaches us that it is something real. Even if we can't put our finger on it and say what it is, we know it exists. Why do we think of spiritual life in a different way? It is just as real and even more real because it is God's own life that we are talking about. And when you think about this, it reaches you and it gets to your heart and you think, has God really made me a partaker of his kind of existence? Not just his kind of existence, but his own existence because if it is his life, it's not something you can take apart from God. It has to be God himself coming and being a part of us when we receive the spiritual life. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is. When God says he gives us the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what he gives to us. You know, I want to read a couple of um, quotes from this little book here, quotes from Ellen White. I'm not going to read too much. I have quite a few that I could read, but I just want to read one or two. Ellen White refers to the Holy Spirit as Listen to how she puts it. The indwelling of the Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. This is not talking about words. This is an actual reality where something outside of humanity comes into humanity. 
Our problem is that because we can't see it, we refuse to come to grips with it. We used to the physical too much because we don't see it or feel it or touch it. We say it cannot be. I'm waiting to feel something to believe it. Don't be so foolish. You trust feelings above the word of God? God says if you believe, he gives you eternal life. This eternal life is the Holy Spirit and it's an actual component that comes into the, into, into the human being. Ellen White again says, and that was from Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 11, 12. And she says again, here's how she puts it. Christ declares that after his ascension, he would send to his church as his crowning gift, the comforter who was to take his place. This comforter is the Holy Spirit, the soul of his life. That's an interesting way to put it. That's taken from this Day with God, page 257. That's an interesting way that the Holy Spirit is the soul of his life. Not just the life of Christ. She goes, she goes further than saying it's the life of Christ. It's the soul or the very essential element in the life of Christ. Yes, Brother Bill. He lost spiritual life. Well, in a sense, spiritual life is, 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 is the only life because the Bible says if you don't have spiritual life, you are living dead. That's right. Here is what the Bible says, you know. God said to Adam and Eve that in the day you eat of the fruit, you will die. Now, without the life of God, nothing has a right to live. Not only does not have a right to live, it cannot exist unless God gives us life, right? So the moment Adam and Eve sinned, they separated themselves from God. What should have happened to them? They should have dropped dead. But instantly... I like the way Ellen White puts it, so I'm going to quote Ellen White. She says, instantly Christ stood between the living and the dead. What does that mean? Instantly, the life of Christ came into play. Christ said, I will make a way. There will be a way. We know that this was a plan that was worked out from even before man's sin. But Christ's blood, Christ's life came into play immediately. So what did God do? Based on what Christ would do, you know what God did? God brought in an, an unnatural condition. And why do I say it was unnatural? Because the natural state of the universe is that when you are separated from God, what happens? You die. So God established an unnatural condition that man could live as a sinner and still continue to exist for a while. That is unnatural. Sinners are not supposed to live for even one second. But because of Christ, God brought in a situation where we could live for a while. Why? So we could get a chance to find our way back to life through Christ. So that is why all of us are people who are on probation. In other words, we have a life, a temporary life, that has been given to us in an unnatural way to give us an opportunity to find a real life again. So, we take life for granted and we think death is alien but and unnatural and we say, God, please don't take my life. I mean, the average person. But the fact is that it's God who is preserving it. We see it the wrong way. It, it's mercy that even gives us a chance, an opportunity to find our way back to that life. Anyway, I think it's just about time for me to end here. And um, some other verses I have here, I will leave them until another time. Yes, I mean, uh, <clears throat> physical life is physical existence. Now, again, because we're talking about life and we don't know enough about it. 
you, you could ask the question, a, a, a spiritual being, he has a quality of life that behaves a certain way, but does, man was made to exist on a physical plane. Angels exist on what you call a spiritual plane. Their bodies are different. When you talk about physical, you talk about bodies that are made up a certain kind of way. Was Adam and Eve in this form at the beginning? And so was it that they lost the spiritual life, but the physical existence continued? What you're asking is, did God introduce physical life as a new element? Right, now, I don't think that I, 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 we can say that, and I, I, we don't have any evidence to say that. I think it was a part of the way things were set up at the beginning. But they retained that physical existence and lost the spiritual side of it, is how I think we should look at it. Anyway, what I'm hoping is that as we have looked at this this afternoon, all of us will recognize that what God has done for us is, is, is real. It's not words. Everybody who is a Christian has partaken of the life of God. And that makes us understand not just the great privilege that is ours, but also the responsibility. Right? I don't believe that threatening or appealing to people's conscience is a way to get them to live right. I don't believe so. I believe that if you have the life of God, you will live different from the world. It's interesting, this week I was having, not this week, one, one, some days ago, you know, my mind was not resting on Christ as it should. And I was finding that I was struggling to maintain my behavior. And I was thinking, that's not the way you should live. You shouldn't be struggling to behave right. It should be a natural thing. But then a thought came to me that made me feel pleased. I said, look here. I know that I have salvation. Whether I have to struggle to live right or it comes naturally, I don't want to let down my Lord. So if you struggle to take, I'm in it the same way. When my mind is not where it should be, my body will not let him down. Now, it might sound like it's the wrong way. But you know, I still felt pleased about it because I realized that even though my mind was not in the frame that it should be, my desire was still for the Lord and to please him. And I think that only God can put that in your heart. I think that when you really truly love and desire to please the Lord, somehow, even when your motivation is not as strong and your mind is not as clear, what do we do then? Do we let go and say, well, let me disgrace him for this while until I'm able to concentrate again? No. Whatever it takes, no. He is the center. He's the heart. He's our life. And maybe it is he himself who is keeping us even those moments, although we cannot see him as clearly as we, we should, as long as there is a desire to live for him and the strength to live for him, even though your mind may not be as free as you would like it to be, then be certain that it is God who is working in us. And I'm hoping that all of us will, even at this camp meeting and beyond, recognize what God has given us. We're no longer mere human beings. As, as people have been saying from morning, we're not mere human beings. We're not ordinary people. We have been made partakers of the very life of God in his Son. Let us believe it that we can experience the reality.